Welcome back to Jay's Office Hours. Um, this is my big end of 2017 show. I guess we can call this a show. Um, and I want to talk today about the process I go through at the end of every year to sort of wrap up uh, the year and then also plan for the next year. Um, and this year is going to be really different because in addition to my normal end of year wrap up, I have an end of decade wrap up to do because... As of December 13th, 2017, which is this year, um, I will have been, a, you know, kind of a pro for the last 10 years. I signed with my first agent, December 13th, 2007. Um, and within a month of signing with him, I had my first book deal, which is a three book deal um, that really completely changed my life. It launched my career and this like crazy 10 year journey I've been on. And so in addition to a year-end wrap-up and planning for the next year, I will also be doing a decade wrap-up and planning for the next 10 years. Um, and I, But I will be using the same process for both. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. So I've talked before in my um, bullet journal uh, posts about how when I do a weekly spread, I do something like this, where I do a wins and lessons um category where I sort of process what I got done that week that was really cool and what also like anything I learned um, that I want to remember moving forward. Um, it can be, you know, sort of a quote I learned that was really meaningful or, hey, um, you know what, you need to be nicer to yourself or uh, you need to spend less time on Twitter, whatever it is. Usually it's you need to spend less time on Twitter. Um, but so what I do is I kind of take that same idea of wins and lessons and I use, I apply it to my year. So I'm going to show you my spread for 2016 on this because I haven't done my 2017 one yet. Uh, it's still a little early. Um, so I, here's the beginning. I do this 2016 wins and I start with this, where I went and I do it kind of by month. Using my bullet journal and like my Google calendar, I go through month by month and I write down all the trips I took. I do this for me because travel is a really important part of my life. It's like my favorite thing. And so I always want to acknowledge like these are all the cool places I went. But it also remembering going back through that process rem helps me remember, oh, I went to this conference. I went to that literary festival. Uh, I went to this convention. I was keynote speaker at this thing. So it kind of gets my mind in the headspace of all the things I got done that year. Um, and so, you know, I took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like nine different trips in 2016. Um, some of them were far, like I went to Pittsburgh, um, and then some were closer, like I went to a con in Fort Worth, which technically shouldn't count as out of town, but it's, I don't know, I spent the night in a hotel, so I counted it. Um, so after I do the where I went, I do a what did I do? part of my wins. And this is where I write down all the cool stuff I did, whether I went to a conference, whether I had a book signing, if I finished a novel, if I finished a short story, um, did I go do any cool things? Um, like, did I go to any concerts? Did I um, teach any classes? Um, I'll even put stuff like, you know, if there was like a major event, like I had some medical issues in 2016. So I wrote that down. So I remember like, oh yeah, that's the year that I was having all those doctor's appointments or whatever. Um, and like, you know, I did a really cool signing that year with Kevin Hearn, Charlene Harris, um, Delilah Dawson and um, Rachel Kane, which was super fun. And I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I also wrote my will. <laughs> My husband and I went and got our wills done that year, which was important to acknowledge because I put it off for so long. Um, so this list is what cool stuff did I do? Uh, just to acknowledge it, you know, I think we get so focused on, you know, things aren't exactly where I want them to be that we miss all the good stuff we're doing in the meantime. Um, so this is just a, a function of like slowing down, acknowledging our hard work, patting ourselves on the back for the stuff we have accomplished on our way to these bigger goals, you know? And I think if there's one lesson I've really learned about 
being happy as a writer. It's that you really have to appreciate the, the victories as small as they are sometimes. Um, because you never, you may never like, you might never get like a seven figure book deal, but you can appreciate the fact that you've written, you know, a hundred thousand words in a year or 500,000 words in a year or whatever it is. Um, these are victories and you can't hit the big victories without the small ones. So it's important to acknowledge them. So after I write down all my wins, I do my lessons list. And if you'll look at this, you'll see that my lessons list is pretty extensive. Like this is, this is everything I did, which is a lot. That would probably fill up a full page. But my lessons list is always at least as long, if not longer. And this is stuff that's like, you know, one of the big things I learned in 2016 was that, um, whoa, this is a huge one. I realized that I had unfinished business with Kate Prospero. I uh, went to lunch with a friend, a couple of friends, and I was talking about how heartbroken I was that I didn't get to finish that series. And they basically said, well, why can't you? And that changed everything. And, you know, then it was like, okay, well, now that I understand this lesson, this helps inform goals moving forward. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Another, you know, other lessons are, you know, some of them are you know, me just reminding myself not to be so hard on myself all the time. And, um, I realized in 2016 that I'm, I really love teaching, which is why I started this vlog, which is why I started teaching English, uh, through a local literacy program, which is why I try and teach more workshops. It's something I really enjoy and it keeps me in love with writing. So I, you know, that was an important lesson to acknowledge. So, you do your wins and you do your lessons and you sit and you think about them a little bit. And then you flip the page and you start a new spread. Mine is big plans and wish list. There's a difference between the two. Big plans is my list of goals. These need to be concrete. They need to be the kinds of things that at the end of the year you can either say, did I accomplish that? Yes or no. Um, so finishing a book, that's a concrete plan. Um, uh, you know, hitting, hitting a list, not a concrete plan, unless you have a very, very specific and foolproof way of making sure that you hit like the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and if you do, it's probably like illegal. I mean, if you know how to do that, that means you're probably gaming the system because, uh, the only person the only people I know who are like, oh yeah, I'm hitting a list no matter what, are usually the people who buy their way onto it and you don't want to be one of those people. So keep it within your power, keep it quantifiable. Um, I am very stingy about what I put on this list because I don't like, I'm not good with goals like write three times a week. That never works for me. Um, those kinds of things go on my wish list. Um, and actually, when I look at my 2017 big plan list, I actually didn't accomplish most of the things on the list. Um, but that's because new things came up, new information happened. Like I thought uh, at the beginning of the year that I was going to go to my old publisher, I was going to propose some new Prospero books, and they were going to buy them, and we were going to move forward. That did not happen. And so I had to change plans, and it ended up working out a lot better. Ha <laughs> ha. It worked out great. Um, but, uh, that was not in my normal goal list. So I didn't accomplish some of the goals that went, ended up on the list because I thought I was going to do it differently. So be flexible with it. Um, my wish list again, much, much longer. Look at that. Look at how much longer that is. Um, and that is because wish lists work better for me because wish lists are about intentions. You know, like I had a wish list, like I want to declutter my house. Now, if I had said declutter your house by December, you know, by February 15th, it would not have happened. But setting the intention, I would like to declutter my house from top to bottom, meant that on a day when I didn't have anything going on and I got the urge to do it, I went and I did it. But I don't think I would have gotten the urge to do it unless it set the intention on the list. Does that make sense? You're basically saying to yourself, like, look, you know, like these are things that I really want to have happen, but I'm not going to sit here and, and like kind of manufacture a deadline for myself. There's some stuff that you, it's not worth setting a, you know, manufacturing a deadline for some stuff there is. 
Um, but for me personally, I know that it's easier for me to trick myself into doing something if I just set it as an intention than if I say, you have to write 10,000 words a day. That will never, ever happen in my house. Okay. I can set weekly goals. Like I'm going to write 30 pages a week that I can do. But if, if it's too structured, it tends not to work for me. That's just something I've learned, but I've learned that because I've done this for years and I know what will work and what won't. Um, so you make your wish list and some of the stuff can be like woo woo. Like, you know, like one of mine was learn to love being alone. Uh, it's not something I've ever been able to do very well, but actually I set this intention in like December of 2016. And then an opportunity in June came up where my husband and son went on like a big two week hike out of the state. And I had the house to myself for two weeks for the first time in 15 years. And it, terrified me because I am not good alone. Um, this overactive imagination with too much alone time is not pretty. Um, but I learned how to do it and I had a great time and I learned a lot about how to be alone that those two weeks. But I don't think that I would have really made an effort to do that if I hadn't set that intention. So that's just a couple of examples of how you can use it. The other thing I'm going to tell you about this planning, and this is the most important bit of advice that I can give you. If you take nothing else, any other part of this exercise, if you don't pay attention to any of the others, that's fine, but pay attention to this one. The best thing I did for myself and do for myself every year is I pick a theme word. My theme word for 2017 was empowered. I picked that theme word before I knew that I was going to go off and become an indie author. So when the time came up and I had a choice of either pursuing a project that I loved and doing it indie, even though it scared the shit out of me, or um, going the traditional path, writing something new, going to a publisher, trying to sell that, even though I really wanted to write this other thing, I had the courage to step away and go do it on my own because my word this year was empowered and I have this post-it on my computer. What is the most empowered choice at this moment? Permission granted. When you have something like this as your intention for the year and you put it in a visible place, when that moment comes, when you have the choice to do something that fits in your goal for the year and something that doesn't, it will be a lot easier if you have this word to use as a touchstone. Because if my big question for the year is, is what's the most empowered choice? It's real hard to be like, no, I'm going to be scared and go do the thing I've always done that makes me angry and frustrated, but hey, it's safe. Now, I'm not saying empowered is my word every year. It was this year, and it worked out for me. And I now, because I did it this year and it worked out so well, now I'm like, I am always doing this. Um, and the process of finding your word can be fun, too. Like, just write down a bunch of adjectives that seem cool, that you're drawn to. You know, look at them. If one doesn't kind of ring, knock it off the list. Look at your goals, look at your wishes, look at your lessons that you learned last year and think, how can I take all of this and encapsulate it into a word that helps me meet my goals? Your, goal, your word might be productive. Your word might be mindful. Your word might be compassionate. Your word might be brave. It might be, um, I mean, literally, it could be any word. I mean, don't let it be a word like no. Or fearful. I mean, those are not good. Just in case you didn't know, those are not good goal words for your year. Pick a word that makes you feel strong. Your word could be strong. Whatever. But try and try and look at your goals, look at your wishes, and see if you can find a word that encapsulates that. And then use it. Put it on your laptop. Um, write it on a post-it and put it on your bathroom mirror so every morning you wake up and you see it. The stuff works. It works. If you look at any of the gurus of self-improvement, Tim Ferriss, Oprah, whoever, this is a technique that everyone uses. I don't have a mantra. I have a word. Now, I mean, it's kind of become a mantra. What's the most empowered choice at this moment? Um, this year was a mantra. Um, but just find something that makes you feel like it'll help you reach your goals. Um, 
I think that this is important no matter where you are in your writing career, uh, even, even if you're pre-career, um, and it might change year to year. You can adapt this process for whatever works for you, but I do think it's an important exercise to do. I think everybody talks about goal setting for the next year, but I have not heard a lot of people say that you should do an end of the year wrap up. I mean, that's something that I think before you set any goals, you have got to process the lessons of the previous year. Um, and in a year like this one, when things have been so contentious and crazy and negative, really, I mean, the, the mood has not been buoyant this year. I don't care what your viewpoint is. It has not been a super happy-go-lucky year for anyone. And I think when years are tough like this, especially for creative people, it's really hard to sort of feel like, what's the point of doing this? Why do I keep putting myself through this? Um, and this process helps remind you why you do it and what you've done and, and what you want to do going forward. And I think having a purpose, um, you know, they've done these studies, like they've looked at like these longevity studies of places where people, you know, live the longest and are the healthiest. And one of the big points, other than eating right and exercising, which ugh, lame, the other one is having a purpose. If you can get out of every day, out of bed every day with a purpose, um, it adds a lot to your life. And that purpose might be to tell your stories. It might be to raise your kids. It might be to be the best, you know, greeter at Walmart you can be. That will help get you get get you through your day. And it's a it's a it's a practice that you can use for your writing and just your normal life. Um, and I think having that word and having your goals and then at the end of the year, looking and seeing how you did, not in like a judgmental grading way, but just sort of like, okay, like also did the goals that I set for myself, is that, were they genuine? Cause if your end of the year doesn't look anything like the goals and intentions you set out for yourself at the beginning of the year, maybe you're not setting the right intentions for yourself. Maybe you're not being honest with yourself about what you really want. And that's important too. All right, so I'm rambling now, so I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. Uh, I got a lot of work to do. I got a year-end list, a next-year list. I got a 10-year wrap-up, which is gonna take me forever to do because it's been busy. Um, and then I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with the next 10 years of my life. I know it'll involve stories, and I hope yours will too. Um, and I just wanna say, since it's the end of the year, one thing. 10 years ago, I had not had anything published. I was where a lot of you are probably right now. I was a stay-at-home mom. I thought I had stories to tell, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know if I was going to be good at it. I didn't know if anybody would want to listen to me. 10 years later, here I am talking to you who is in the place I was 10 years ago. And I have this to say. I would not have traveled the places I've traveled. I would not have met the places, met the people I've met. I would not have all these amazing experiences um, that I've had over the last 10 years if I hadn't written my first story and then my second and then my third. It was my third book that got published. You never know which one's going to do it. And all of this stuff that I have in my life that I love and that I talk about and I get really mushy about is because I love telling stories and it's worth doing if it's if you're drawn to do it if you're called to do it if you just think it's cool it's worth doing um, and it's worth sticking out even if it doesn't turn out the way you thought it was going to turn out even if the big, big wish goals that you put on your list aren't the ones that you end up getting, you will find new ones that fulfill your life. If you stick with it and you do it in a healthy way and you do it in a way that's about like serving your higher purpose and not because you want to get rich and you want the world to love you and all these other ego-driven reasons that we write. I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but I really hope you have a great holiday I hope the new year is prosperous and happy and healthy for you. But most of all, I wish you happy writing.